Okay, so we're going to get started. Uh, so welcome to the Collège de France, to the Forest Content Distinction uh, Workshop. So the first speaker will be Francois Reconnavi of the Collège de France. So Francois is going to speak for 45 minutes, and then we're going to go straight to questions for 30 minutes. And if you have a question, you should come up here and sit in this chair. And uh, so that don't there, be shy. <laughs> so yeah, don't be shy, uh, because there are people participating via Zoom, and so they need to be able to see and also hear you. It's being recorded. All oh, right. Um, so uh, 45 minutes of talk, and then 30 minutes of question, and then we'll take a short break, and then begin the second talk. Uh, so Francois' title is the Aristotelian view, the Spinoza's thesis, and the Frege point. Thank you, Gilip. So I start with the Frege point. So Dietsch uh, made the statement that thought may have just the same content, whether you assent to it, to its truth or not. A proposition may occur in discourse, now asserted, now unasserted, and yet be recognizably the same proposition. And that's the point that he ascribes to Frege, saying that Frege was the first to have made it explicitly, forcefully, and emphatically, something like that. And it's true that uh, you don't find this view, for example, in Aristotle. And uh, Aristotle's view on this is very different and actually incompatible with the Frege point. Uh, but it's been extremely influential. You find versions of that view until fairly recently. Uh, so the view I call the Aristotelian view is the idea that there is no distinction really between predicating the property of an object composing a predicate on the subject, as it were, to make a proposition, uh, there is no difference between that and actually asserting of the object that it has the property. Uh, here you have quotations about Aristotle. For example, the second one says, for Aristotle, making an assertion is not different from attributing a predicate to a subject, but by the very same act by which I compose Socrates and White, when I say Socrates is White, I judge that there is something named Socrates and that it is white, or something like that. So the idea basically is that predication and assertion, that's more or less the same thing, or that predication is assertoric in nature. And this view, as I said, has been very influential. You find versions of the view until fairly recently. Uh, and there are sustained defense of the view in Aquinas, for example. Uh, but let me mention that, contrary to what, what Gitch suggests, the Frederick points was actually made well before Frege and repeatedly, and sometimes very explicitly. So I don't have time to go into that, but actually Scottus made the point, introduced the distinction, and Ockham inherited it presumably from Scottus, and Buridan made the point as well. And in modern times, in Descartes, you find a sort of sharp contrast between uh, thinking or or say conceiving a proposition or entertaining a proposition versus assenting to the truth of the proposition because assent is an act of the will for Descartes while understanding is a, an operation of the intellect. And I, here I gave a citation, very explicit citation from Thomas Reed who also introduces the, the, the false content distinction and makes the Frederick point. He says, we may distinctly conceive a proposition without judging of it at all. So it's not as if the distinction was actually unknown before Frege. It was, it was well known, even though not as influential as it had been since Frege. Now, the Frege point leads, naturally leads to what the next speaker in this conference calls the additive view uh, that propositions are intrinsically forceless. So they are not intrinsically assertoric. And force, assertive force, is added from outside when the act of judging or asserting occurs. So the mind sort of judges. Its object is a certain proposition, and the mind assents to that proposition, but the proposition is something that's quite independent of this act of judging. It's certainly not constituted by the act of judging, as on the Aristotelian view. On the Aristotelian view, propositions are intrinsically forceful, not forceless. But Oops. According to Dietsch, the additive view is not the only option compatible with the Frederick point. There is another option. 
that Dietsch associates with Spinoza. And he formulates the view as follows, the, this alternative to the, to the additive view, the alternative that's also compatible with the Frege point. He says, perhaps a thought is a saturating character unless it loses this character by occurring only as an element in a more complicated thought. So here Dietsch thinks of uh, cases in which, say, a proposition occurs as the antecedent of a conditional. That's one of the cases in which the proposition is not asserted by the person who has who asserts the conditional. And there would be other cases in which possibly the force, the intrinsic force of the proposition might be canceled by its context, the context in which it occurs. It's interesting to note that also this view, the Spinoza's view, was also uh, anticipated by medieval writers. So here I've got, uh, so what someone says about Buridan, uh, for Buridan, the assertive force of a proposition is not something that's added to a, per se an asserted proposition, rather it's something that belongs to a proposition uh, per se, but which can be canceled out when the proposition is embedded in the context of a hypothetical. So that would be the sort of Spinoza's option anticipated by Buridan. And I think there have been a quite serious revival of the Spinoza's position in recent times. And I'm going to go through some landmarks in the, this revival. I start with a position that's not well known, actually, even though a famous philosopher put it forward, namely Gilbert Ryle. Uh, Gilbert Ryle says, supposing, supposing is one of the cases in which you entertain a proposition without asserting it, without judge, judging it, supposing is a more sophisticated operation than ingenious thinking, the case in which you simply judge the proposition to be the case, or you affirm it. This point is worth making because logicians and epistemologists sometimes assume, what I for a long time assumed, that entertaining a proposition is a more elementary or naive performance than affirming that something is the case, which is basically the additive view. The additive view says that there is the proposition you can entertain. In addition, there is this act of the mind that assents to the proposition or judges it to be true. And that's more complicated. There are two components there. Instead, well, in the case of the proposition, there is that you entertain, there is this simple component. Uh, and, and Wright says, this is a mistake. The concept of make-believe is of a higher order than that of belief. So what Wright suggests is that when you believe something, that's fairly simple, that's a simple operation. You judge that something is the case. But there is a more complex operation in which you can simulate that judgment. And then there is something additional, this sort of made-believe operator that takes, that operates on the, the judgment and makes it into something else, a simulated judgment, and that's not really a judgment. On this view, unasserted propositions are basically uh, simulated or judgments, something like that. That's basically the view I hold. So, the, so I'll start with this quotation that sort of uh, summarizes the view I'm going to argue for. Uh, sorry. The next step in the revival is Peter Ditch himself. Because Ditch, when he talks about these options, and also in another work here is the Mental Arts, the book on Mental Arts, he says, I incline to the view of Spinoza myself, that's what he says, uh, that a thought is by nature a certain and is inhibited from being so only by standing in some spatial relation to a context of other thoughts, that's Spinoza. And that's the view he says he prefers. That's interesting because normally people ascribe the additive view to Gitch, but that's not actually the view he held. Uh, next step in the revival that's more recent, the psychologist Daniel Dilbert and his followers. What Dilbert says is that it's a mistake, it was Descartes' mistake to separate understanding or comprehension, as he calls it, from acceptance. He says there is no way in which you can separate comprehension from acceptance, because comprehension itself involves acceptance at some basic level. Basically, when you understand the proposition, you represent the situation described as holding, and that's already a form of temporary acceptance. Of course, he accepts that uh, the acceptance in question, that's the, the acceptance that's constitutive of understanding, it can be canceled. It can be repudiated. So as he says, uh, Spinoza's thesis implies that unacceptance, that's what he calls unacceptance, is when you cancel 
your initial acceptance of some proposition. He says, an acceptance is a secondary psychological act in which the initial accepting that invariably accompanies comprehension is subsequently undone. So here the idea is that when you entertain a proposition, there is an assertory component there, but that assertory component can be canceled by the context in which the proposition is entertained. Uh, for example, if it's a piece of fiction, there is this assertory component that's immediately canceled by your knowledge that this is fiction, something like that. And finally, uh, Peter Hanks in this room, there are also in this room people who have argued for the Gilbert's, Gilbert's position. Uh, Hanks, and that's sort of controversial. Yesterday I had this, this, this discussion with Peter Hanks, who participates in our workshop, and he sort of might deny that the view I ascribe to him is actually his, but so it's my, my, my understanding of his. Uh, uh, here is a citation. He says that acts of predication, the act that's constitutive of the proposition, the act that unites the predicate and the subject, uh, acts of predication are judgmental or assertorate in character, and they commit the speaker to things being the way they are represented to be in the act of predication. So that's sort of the Aristotelian view, that there is something intrinsically assertorate about predication. And he says, the fact that we do not assert the antecedent or the consequent in an utterance of a conditional is consistent with thinking that an assertoric element is included in, in, included in the contents of declarative sentences. When a sentence is used inside the conditional, the assertive element is canceled by the presence of the conditional, again, the Spinoza's view. Now, I'm going to discuss in this talk, really, the, it's very complicated. It doesn't look that complicated, but I find it very complicated to uh, say exactly what the relations are between, say, the Aristotelian view, uh, the Frege points, and the, and, and the Spinoza's view. There are I'm not going to go into all the complications, but it's really complicated. So I want to clarify this, this relation to say exactly what the positions are, what the options are. And I think that we should uh, uh, put the Spinoza's thesis and the Aristotelian view together in the same basket as opposed to the additive view. Because both the Aristotelian view and the, and, and the, and the Spinoza's position uh, accept something which I call judgment first or assertion first. That's a claim that's common as opposed to the additive view. And the claim judgment first is the claim that the notion of assertion or judgment, I use that them more or less interchangeably, uh, comes first. And that's the thought or proposition is derivative. So the thing that's the content of assertion or judgment the notion of that content itself presupposes the notion of assertion or judgment. So it's not as if the content propositions were, it was independent of the act of judgment or asserting as on the additive view. The act of judging or asserting is uh, somehow constitutive of content. But, but of course, there are different ways of uh, understanding this claim that judgment comes first and that the notion of thought of proposition presupposes that of assertion or judgment. Uh, so here's the, basically a picture of the landscape. We have the additive view that propositions are intrinsically forceless and judgment is force comes from outside through the act of the mind that judges or, or asserts. As opposed to that, we've got the judgment first idea that says that content is not independent of assertion or judgment. Uh, and somehow there is a assertion or judgment is somehow constitutive of content, but there are different ways of in interpreting this. There is a strong interpretation, which is that which the Aristotelian view, Aristotelian view provides. And then there is a weaker interpretation, which I want to argue for. So the strong interpretation, that's the Aristotelian view, says basically that predicating is asserting to predicate a property of an object is to ascribe that property of the object that's correct or incorrect, depending on whether the object has that property or not. So that's asserterate. And the thought is what you get when you predicate a property of an object. That is, when you assert that the object has the property. So thoughts, indeed, thought contents depend upon the act of judgment or assertion that 
constitutes the content in question. So the act of assertion or judgment is constitutive of the asserted content rather than superadded from the outside, as on the additive view. Now, an immediate consequence of that, I think that has to be faced rather than uh, ev evaded. Uh, an immediate consequence of that is that there cannot be unasserted thoughts or unasserted propositions. Uh, because propositions only exist to the extent that there is this act of asserting or judging or the act of striving the predicate to the object. So if the act doesn't take place, there is no proposition. Therefore, there cannot be any unasserted proposition. If there is a proposition, there is an assertion. If there is no assertion, there is no proposition. So of course, this conflicts with the Frege points, which is a big problem because the Frege points seems to be fairly trivial. Of course, there are options for the Aristotelian theorists. With some ingenuity, you can find solutions to your problem, and I'm going to discuss those solutions later, but now I'm going to move to the weaker interpretation. The weaker interpretation I call the B option, and the B here stands from Brentano. I'm going to talk about the A options later. They stand for Aristotle. So the B option accepts the Frederick points, and takes it for granted that there are unasserted propositions. So that's not something that's discussed, that's just accepted. But the B option construes those unasserted propositions as derivative upon bona fide assertions. So what comes first is this notion of assertion, and then there is a derivative notion, uh, a bit like in Rye, where Rye says that unasserted propositions are simulated assertions. Clearly, the notion of simulated assertion is derivative upon the notion of an assertion. So that's the idea. Uh, I call that the, I, I, I mentioned Brentano because in Brentano you find this notion of modification. Uh, and, 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 and we should think, in this framework here, you, we should think of an asserted proposition as modified assertions in the sense of Brentano. Now, modification for Brentano. Uh, that's really uh, part of a discussion in Brentano and his students of the different types of non, uh, adjective noun combinations that you can find. So there is a case like a blue box. A blue box is a box, a box that is blue. So that's a regular sort of a combination. But there is also the, the non-regular one, like a plastic lemon or a fake lemon. And clearly a plastic lemon is not a lemon, not really a lemon. So in this case, Brentano says that the noun is semantically modified. The lemon here no longer means what it normally means because of the effect of the adjective. But anyway, I won't go into the details of this theory of modification that you find in Brentano. What matters simply is the analogy with things like plastic lemons. Uh, it, it, it take again Wright's view that unasserted propositions are simulated assertions. That you entails that unasserted propositions are not assertions because simulated is a modifier in Brentano's sense. A simulated burglary is not really a burglary. Similarly, a simulated assertion is not really an assertion. So if you take an asserted proposition to be something like what Wright says, namely simulated assertions, you have to say that they are not assertions. And therefore, predication itself because predication is something that happens whether you are genuinely assert something or whether you merely express a proposition, uh, say, as antecedent in a conditional, without asserting it. Uh, predication cannot be the same thing as assertion. It's got to be common to the case in which the proposition is asserted, the normal case, and to the simulative case in which the proposition is not asserted. Predication is common to the two cases. Therefore, predication cannot be equated to uh, assertion. Therefore, we have to give up the Aristotelian view. Still, this is all in accordance with judgment first, because the latter, that is the simulative case, is derivative upon the former, namely the, the case of regular assertion. So we take regular assertion to be the basic case. There is a derivative case, simulated assertion. And predication is something that's common to both of them. You predicate whether you genuinely assert or simulate assertion. That's something that you do in both cases. Uh, actually, what you do in both cases is you go through the motions of asserting, and seriously in one case and in another case, maybe for some other purposes. Right. I'm going to go back to the B option later. That's the view I favor, as I said. I'm going to say what 
some consequences of the view. But first, I would like to go back to the Aristotelian position, uh, because I mentioned the fact that the Aristotelian theorist has this problem that his view entails the rejection of the Frederick points. And so, therefore, the, the theorist has something to do uh, to make it palatable, to make it plausible that we might reject the Frederick point that seems so obvious. Uh, so for the Aristotelian theories, there is no, there cannot be any unassorted thought or unassorted proposition. But there are things that look like unassorted propositions, like when the actor on the stage uh, says something and makes what's supposed to be an assertion, but of course it's theater, it's not really an assertion. The actor is playing the part of someone who's asserting something, or when you have a declarative sentence used as an antecedent of a condition rule, you're not asserting the antecedent, it's just because you're asserting the condition rule and that's merely a vote. Uh, so there are cases like that in which propositions seem to be unasserted. The two possibilities, the two options for the Aristotelian theorist who wants to deny the Frederick point that propositions may occur unasserted, the two options are first, deny that the allegedly unasserted propositions are actually unasserted and maintain that they are asserted. That's the first option. And the second option is to say, yes, they are not asserted, but they are not propositions. Therefore, no propositions can occur unasserted because when there's something that looks like an unasserted proposition, it's not a proposition at all. So there are these two options. I call them options A1 and option A2, again, A for Aristotle, options for the Aristotelian theories. Now, for option A1, I take to be the strategy pursued by uh, Gilbert and Hans, even though Peter uh, thinks, might deny that this is his view. But I'm going to argue that this view actually is unstable and collapses into the B option. So it's okay if actually uh, Peter's position is the B option. That would be natural because it's hard to maintain this A1 option without actually falling back into the B option. That's what I'm going to argue. Okay, anyway, the, the view is this, predicating the thing that takes place whether you are assert or not, at least on the face of it, predicating is asserting. Predicating a property of an object is ascribing the property to the object, and that is assertorate in nature. But a cancellation operation has the power of rendering the assertion ineffective. So the speaker who expresses what looks like an, an asserted proposition, actually asserts the proposition, but in a context that deprives the act of its, say, normative consequences, re renders it ineffective. The important thing is that on this view, unasserted propositions do incorporate an act of assertion. The speaker does assert that A is F, that is, does ascribe Fness to A, but in a spatial context which cancels the force of the assertion. So the assertion is there, but it is neutralized. That's the idea. Or as I put it here, the assertion actually occurs, but it occurs in a canceling context. And when that happens, the assertion is disarmed and becomes ineffective. But it is performed nonetheless. That's the essence of the view, that the assertion is still there. And it is performed, but in a special context that cancels it forth. So on this view, canceled assertion is a variety of assertion. It is an assertion, in contrast to the Brentano view. On the Brentano view, a simulated assertion is not an assertion. So an unasserted proposition is not an assertion. It just looks like one. Uh, but here, we take canceled assertions to be assertions, assertions that occur in a special context. So it's not a modification in Brentano's sense. So option A1, corresponds to what in an earlier paper I call the meriological model of force cancellation, a model according to which canceled assertions are a variety of assertions alongside straightforward, that is, uncanceled assertions. So a, li a little more about the, analog the, the meriological model and the reason why I call it that way. Uh, there is this analogy, very useful analogy due to Jin Ho Kang, uh, that the analogy is this, there is this action of switching on the lights, and we perform this action by pressing the button, for example. 
but pressing the button turns on the light only if the circumstances are appropriate. If the electric network is out of order, pressing the button won't do anything. So we can distinguish between the inner act, pressing the button, and the outer act, which it constitutes when and only when the circumstances are appropriate. So we can represent the outer act as an order pair of uh, these two things, the inner act and the circumstances that have to be appropriate for the outer act to take place. In the case of assertion, we say exactly the same thing. That normal assertion is the case in which you have an assertion that takes place in appropriate circumstances, and therefore it has its full power, its full normative consequences. But if the same act of assertion takes place in a cancelling context, then it is a cancelled assertion, and the cancelled assertion is an assertion, but it's rendered ineffective by the cancelling context, and it loses its normative consequences. So that's the view, that's what I understand of the view, both in the case of Gilbert and in the case of Hans. Uh, I call this the meteorological model of fourth constellation because both full-fledged assertion or normal assertion and cancelled assertion contain the inner act of assertion as a proper part. And that's a proper part that's common to the two varieties of assertion, full-fledged assertion and cancelled assertion. What's interesting about this option, A1, is that it rests on a distinction between two notions of assertion, the inner and the outer notion. Uh, so there is the notion of assertion one, which is the normal, normal assertion, straightforward assertion or full-fledged assertion. And it consists of an inner act of assertion, assertion two, plus the appropriate circumstances. And when assertion is canceled, you've got the same act of assertion two, but in inappropriate circumstances, in a cancelling context, therefore you don't have the act of full-fledged assertion, assertion one. What's interesting, once you have this distinction, is that if you are an Aristotelian theorist, you can concede that unasserted propositions are not assertion in the first sense, they are not assertions one, and therefore you pay lip service to the Frederick points but at the same time, you may insist that they still they are assertions. They are assertions too. And in this way, you protect the Aristotelian view. So that's the attraction of option A1. But as I said, there's a big problem for that view, that it's unstable and it collapses into the B option. Because the question that immediately arises is, what is this inner act of assertion too? And I think there is only one possible answer to assert in this inner sense, to assert in the second sense, to, assert, to make, perform the act of asserting two, is simply going through the motions of asserting one. It's doing the sort of thing that you do when you assert in the full sense. For example, uttering a declarative sentence, sorry, uh, and so on and so forth. But this act, the act of going through the motions, is not forceful or assertory in the relevant sense. It does not commit the speaker to things being the way they are represented to be in the act of predication. That's what we mean by assertory in, in, in the standard sense. The act of, this act of assertion too is performed even if the speaker is ironical and does not mean what he says. So this is not a genuine act of assertion. We may call it assertion if we want to, but it's not really assertion. And that's exactly the sort of thing that the B theorist talks about when he says that in this case, we are simulating assertion. Yes, we are going through the motions. We are doing as if we were asserting. We are doing the same sort of thing that normally constitutes assertion, but not in this case. Okay. Now, so suppose that we go for the B option because that's the only valid option. I believe this A1 option, I think it's not really, it, it collapses into the B option. Now there are problems if we go for the B option. There are several views that have been put forward that are hard to maintain if we take that view, that if we follow these rules. For example, there is a Peter Hans' simple solution to the problem of the unity of the proposition. What Peter says is that what provides the unity of the proposition uh, is the fact that the predicate is ascribed to the subject. 
That's what provides the unity. I, I find it a very simple and great solution to the problem. And I'd like to maintain that. But it seems that we can't if we take the B option, uh, because according to the B option, no such act of actually ascribing the property to the object in this forceful manner, a manner that commits the speaker to things being that way, uh, no such act is actually performed when the proposition is not asserted. You're not performing the act, you're only simulating its performance. So perhaps we have to give up this nice solution to the problem of the unity of the proposition. Actually, I don't think so. Uh, in an earlier paper on forced cancellation, I claim that what unifies the proposition can be a forceful act of assertion without the act in question being actually performed by the speaker who expresses the proposition. What unifies the proposition may be the forceful act of assertion that's projected by the utterance in virtue of its conventional meaning. That is the act of assertion which is evoked or simulated by the utterance. Uh, so, so we can't stick to that view about the unity problem. Uh, I don't think that it raises a, a difficulty for, for the B option. I'm not going to say more about this aspect. Uh, there is another view that uh, seems to be in tension with the, the, the view I defend, uh, this B option. That's, again, Peter Hunt's view that propositions are, should be construed as types of act, types of act of assertion or pred full, for, forceful predication. So there is this act in which we ascribe a property to an object. The proposition that the object has the property is only an, the type of act in which one predicates the property of the object, where predication is understood as being forceful, assertoric. Now, the problem is that if the act of actually ascribing the property to the object, the act of assertion, is not performed, but is merely evoked or simulated, as I claim, in cases in which the proposition is not asserted, then, if the act is not performed, the proposition is not uh, construed as a type of act. The proposition is not instantiated because the act is not performed. Therefore, the, the type of act is not instantiated. And therefore, that means, if you take this view of propositions, that the proposition doesn't actually occur because it's not instantiated. So that's a strange consequence. And here I should mention that that's exactly Bronzo's conclusion. Bronzo is the next speaker. Bronzo denies that so-called unassorted propositions are genuine occurrences of propositions. So he denies that actually there are propositions that occur when they are not asserted. And that's what I call option A2. So now let me say something about option A2. I'll come back to this act theoretic view of propositions in a moment. Option A2 pro protects the Aristotelian view that predicating is asserting by rejecting the Frege point, that is, by rejecting the claim that propositions may occur unasserted. What occurs as antecedent in a conditional or as a disjunct in a disjunction is not a proposition, Bonzo says. It is the simulation of a proposition. That's a different beast altogether. And the simulation, he says, does not carry propositional content. It does not instantiate the relevant act type, as you might say. It merely simulates an act of assertion which does carry propositional content. Not being propositions, the disjunct in a disjunction, and of course the same works for the other connectives, mutatis mutandis, the disjunct in a disjunction are neither true nor false because they are not propositions, they are merely simulations. But a disjunction still has truth conditions, according to Bronzo, but we have to formulate uh, things a little differently from the standard formulations. We have to say that the disjunction is true just in case one of the disjuncts, which are not propositions again, they are merely simulations, a disjunction is true just in case one of the disjuncts simulates a true proposition. And in this way, we get the truth conditions we want for the complex proposition. So that's option A2. And let me comment, and let me state my position with respect to that interesting option. I agree, of course, that unasserted propositions are simulations. That's common to my view and to Bronzo's. But I deny that they are deprived of propositional content. I want to say, yes, they have propositional content. So when you have a, something that's a simulated judgment, there is, oops, a certain content. Uh, 
the content of the similarity to judgment just is the content of the judgment that's being simulated. In other words, uh, simulation inherits the content of the assertions they simulate. And I believe this is not just a stipulation. It might be a stipulation. I don't see why I would not stipulate that. It's certainly open to me to do so. But I think it's not just a stipulation because I think this is a general feature of uh, what I call parasitic speech apps, of which simulated assertion is a variety. This notion of parasitic speech apps, uh, Michael has a similar notion. Uh, and let me say something about this. Actually, you find also something along those lines in Ryle. Ryle has a distinction between what he calls higher order tasks and lower order tasks. And he says, meaning by a higher order task, one, the description of which incorporates the notion of another task of a less complex description. That's exactly what we have for the relation between assertion and simulated assertion. Simulated assertion is the more complex task, the higher order task, the description of which incorporates the description of the simpler act of, of assertion. Uh, let me give an example of a, of a, of a, a sort of, of, of parasitic speech at. Uh, on Frederick's analysis, when he talks about yes, no questions, Frederick says something to the effect that yes, no questions are parasitic with respect to the corresponding assertions. Because for him, a yes, no interrogative presents or evokes a potential assertion, that's the lower order speech act, and asks the hearer to embrace that speech act, that is to say yes, to actually make the assertion, or to disavow or to repudiate that speech chat by saying no, and actually asserting the opposite proposition. And the request is the higher order speech chat performed by the interrogative sentence. And that's parasitic on the lower order speech chat, which is the assertion which the speaker asks the hearer to make. So a parasitic speech chat can be seen as a result of applying a certain function to some primary speech chat or basic speech chat, the lower order speech chat, and in the example I've just given, the interrogative function maps the assertion that it is raining, for example, to the demand that the hearer should embrace or disavow the assertion that it is raining. So here, clearly, you see that in the description of the higher-order speech chart, you have it embeds, it incorporates the description of the lower-order speech chart. Let me hear the assertion. Similarly, I want to say the simulative function maps the primary speech chart of asserting that P to the parasitic speech chart of simulating the assertion that P. And we find exactly the same relation between the lower order uh, simulated speech chart and the higher order, namely the simulation itself. So what we see with this example is that the parasitic speech chart inherits the content of the lower order speech chart it's parasitic on. And interestingly, and that uh, corresponds to what I said earlier, what unifies the provisional content of a parasitic act of simulated assertion is the lower level act of assertion which the higher level act is parasitic on. So given all this, given this conception, we don't have to accept Bronzo's claim that simulated assertions are devoid of propositional content. We can maintain that propositions may occur unasserted. We don't have to give, that, give up the Frederick point. Now I go back to this issue of uh, the act theoretic view of proposition, the, the idea that propositions are the type of act consisting is predicating the property of the object, that is of asserting that the object has the property. That's something I said that we cannot maintain uh, because we will say that there is a proposition, the proposition occurs unasserted, therefore there is no act of assertion, only simulated assertion, still the proposition occurs. If the proposition was the type of act, that type is not instantiated, therefore the proposition should not occur. That was the problem that led to option A2. So if we want to maintain contra bronzo, that the proposition that John is bold is expressed when the speaker simulates the assertion that John is bold, then we need to give up Hans' analysis of that proposition as identical to the act type of asserting that John is bold. And that's what I suggest we do. We have to give up that, but we can maintain a very similar view. We can equate the proposition that John is bold to the superordinate act type of either asserting that John is bold or simulating the assertion that John is bold. That's just the, the, that type you find at the, at the higher level. And that actually corresponds to this notion of predication, because as I said earlier, we have a sort of disjunctivist notion of predication. Predicating is what you do when you assert that the object has the property, but also when you simulate that assertion. It's something common, and also to all the simulations of higher levels that you could have. 
so that fits very well with this understanding of proposition as this higher, uh, uh, higher level at type. Okay, and now I've got only three minutes. Actually, more because you I haven't started at, uh, yeah, how many? Um, I didn't start it. Eight, eight minutes. Eight minutes, right. Okay, so then I can do what I thought I might skip. Uh, Bronzo has an argument, again, the view, sort of view I've just presented. The view I've just presented, uh, which I call option B, combines the Frederick point and the judgment first idea. That is the claim that asserted thoughts are conceptually prior to unasserted thoughts. And Bronzo says that the only way to vindicate judgment first is by giving up the Frederick point. That's what he says. He says there is no way in which you can reconcile these two views. And therefore, hybrid positions like mine are just hopeless. That's what he says. And here, a citation, there is, no, there is no room for a position like Hans or Rectanatis, he also ascribes this hybrid position to Peter, uh, which seeks to allow for the forceless entertainment or expression of propositional contents while vindicating the conceptual priority of judgments and assertions. Okay, so what's the argument? Here's the argument. He says, for the Frederick point, there is a truth evaluable common factor between the asserted and, uh, and unasserted thought. So whether you assert or not, there is this proposition that's common. Of course, that's people who accept the Frederick point accept that. Moreover, the only difference between the two is that in one case, the common factor, the proposition is asserted, while the, uh, in, other, in the other case, it is not. Yes, I accept that. The truth evaluable common factor, the proposition, is therefore forceless. It's devoid of force because it has force only when it's asserted, and when it's not asserted, you don't have the force. Therefore, the common factor doesn't, doesn't involve the force that's only added when there is assertion. An unasserted thought is a thought simpliciter, it's just the proposition, conceived as truth evaluable and forceless, while an asserted thought is a thought thus conceived plus asserted, assertory force. So that's how he describes the Frederick point and its consequences. And he comments, at this point, there is no room left for the claim that asserted thoughts are conceptually prior to unasserted thoughts. The conceptually fundamental notion is that of an unasserted thought, since the notion of an asserted thought is defined in terms of it rather than the other way around. So that's the, that's the argument. And I'm not convinced. I think that from the Frederick point to the effect that there is a truth evaluable common factor, the thought or the proposition, that is asserted in one case and unasserted in the other case, it does not follow that the thought in question or the proposition in question is forceless in the strong sense that is relevant to the debate over judgment first. Because what judgment first says, basically, is that there's something assertoric in thoughts or propositions. There's something intrinsically assertoric. But in the weak interpretation of that claim, in a possibly the weak interpretation of that claim. So there are different notions of forceless. And I believe that there is an equivocation in Bronzo's argument when he says that if you accept the Frederick point, you have to accept that the proposition that may be asserted or not asserted has got to be forceless. Of course, it has got to be forceless in one sense. It is forceless in the sense that it may or may not be asserted. Sometimes it's not asserted and it's still the same proposition. Therefore, that proposition is forceless in a certain sense. But it is forceless, I claim, only in the weak sense that it is not the content of an act of assertion in those cases in which the proposition is not asserted. The speaker or thinker merely simulates the assertion of that proposition in those cases. But still, I would say that even in those cases in which the proposition is not asserted, it is not forceless in the strong sense because the proposition owes its existence 
to the act of assertion or, or judgment, which is performed when the proposition is asserted and which is merely simulated when it is not. So the proposition is, again, presupposes this notion of, sorry, the propositional content presupposes this notion of assertion. The assertion doesn't have to be performed, but the notion of assertion is needed to characterize the, the, the propositional content itself, given the way I characterize predication. Again, the parasitic act of simulated assertion inherits its content from the assertion it simulates, and that is enough to establish that asserted thoughts are conceptually prior to unasserted thoughts. And I'll stop here. Thank you. Very clear talk, as, as usual. Uh, but I, I find this view basically puzzling because it seems to me that this simulation or the weak notion of assertion is basically an idle wheel. Uh, unless it's extended to uh, assertion one, assertion in the full sense, uh, nothing really happens. It, it just goes away or, or does nothing. So it would seem that it's uh, empirically equivalent uh, to the additive view, which says that uh, there is just assertion one, which is added to predication, which is intrinsically forceless, uh, and the result is some, uh, of, uh, something that's fully asserted. On, the, on your view, there is uh, assertion two, which is, um, creates the, the proposition, um, but without uh, assertion one, uh, it's just an honest, not fully asserted proposition. So I, I don't see that there is any um, empirical difference between the two. The, the only concerns uh, some inner uh, mechanisms that we will never notice. I can, yes. no operation, nothing has to be done to, okay. Uh, yeah, there is a sense in which, indeed the empirical coverage of these views uh, are the same. By the way, my view is not, I don't use this notion of assertion two, assertion one, that's, that's, the, that's the A1 option. I repudiate Simulation this. Simulation then, is instead of assertion two. Yes. So the, the main reason, actually, for holding the sort of view I propose, even though it seems a slightly more complicated version of the standard view, is that it makes it possible to maintain this notion of judgment first. The idea that what's really basic is this notion of judgment, and that the cases in which propositions are unasserted is a derivative notion rather than something more basic. So the idea is that we can understand entertaining or merely entertaining as being the simulation of the sort of thing we do when, when we judge. And I see all sorts of uh, advantages of, of this view, but again, that it's not a matter of, again, empirical coverage. Uh, what's interesting about this view, for example, I mentioned this problem of the unity of the proposition. Of course, there are some people who say we don't care about that problem, we should take that as sort of some, some primitive that needs no explanation and so on. But if, you, if you're happy with this solution that Peter proposes that what provides a unity is just the act of the mind that describes the property to the object. Uh, the problem is that it seems that there is a big problem for this view, which is that sometimes propositions are not asserted, that is, you don't actually perform that act. And it's okay if you say, as I do, that indeed what provides a unity is this act of the mind. And in the basic case, the case of asserted proposition that does the trick, and the other case is, cases in which the assertion is simulated, then we have to analyze the simulation of the assertion as a parasitic speech act and says that indeed there is a certain relation between the higher order and the lower order speech act, um, in virtue of which the higher order speech act inherits the content of the lower order speech act, and then you can maintain this idea that it is the lower order speech act of assertion that constitutes the provisional content, even when that is passed along to the simulation of the next level. So that's one thing. Another thing is that you might have reason from, say, cognitive science to think that indeed judging is more basic than supposing, which is something that's why I want to say. Uh, 
uh, it's a, uh, supposing, as it says, is a more sophisticated operation. And I think that's right. Well, the additive view, again, it may be taken, the additive view, there may be uh, different ways of understanding it. Maybe there is a sort of innocuous manner in which you might say that it doesn't, there is no philosophical baggage associated with it. It simply says that there are these two things, and that might be okay, but it certainly suggests that uh, there is this simple act of the mind which is entertaining, something that some people say. You can entertain or imagine or conceive something, that's one act of the mind, and there is a more complex case in which you have this act of con 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 conceiving plus the act of assenting, and that's more complex. And I want to resist that. I want to say that the simple act is the act of judging, and it's only when you have mere, merely conceiving or merely entertaining, that's more complex. That's, again, the right position. Is there time for a follow-up? Or... Um, maybe one last one, and then... Uh, yeah, so um, maybe there is something to uh, be had from um, cognitive science, but it, it seems to me that um, by not seeing if there is no empirical difference um, between the simple additive view and the Brentano-esque simulation view, uh, then it seems to me that, that you at least risk uh, pulling the uh, theoretical force uh, away from the theory by saying that it's not from, from the view, uh, judgment first view, by, say, uh, by saying it's not a, a real judgment at all, it's something else that we, uh, it's only simulation. So the judgment first view uh, reduces to a judgment or simulation first view. Uh, and that's qu something quite different from the judgment first view. Sorry, why, why does it reduce, why the, the judgment first view reduces to the judgment or simulation? Be because you get uh, the um, proposition from either a judgment or a simulation. Yeah, but the simulation itself depends upon the judgment. The simulation is, a, is conceptually dependent on the simulation is the simulation of a judgment. If there were no judgment, there would be no simulation of judgment. So there is this conceptual priority of judgment over simulation of judgment. So you mean that the judgment actually takes place temporarily? First the judgment. No, no, conceptual, then, no, no, I say conceptual. So the judgment the first view is the view that the notion of assertion or judgment is conceptually prior to this notion of a proposition which may well be unasserted. Uh, because, so that's the idea, conceptually prior. That doesn't mean that, indeed, that's option A1 that says that the judgment has to take place for the simulation of the judgment to take place. I don't want to accept that. Mm. I'm saying it's only conceptually prior. That's a weaker interpretation of judgment first. And it is conceptually prior if you think of the unasserted proposition are cases in which the judgment is merely simulated, and you keep that, that notion. And by the way, when I said uh, that it's empirically, I accepted the idea that it might be empirically equivalent. I meant with respect to the very narrow domain that we're concerned with when we are thinking of complex propositions, because if you take the broader notion, the broader empirical domain, which includes the cognitive sciences and so on, and, and the relation between uh, different things like cases about fiction, what we do when we read fiction and so on. If you take everything on board, then there would be an empirical difference, I think, but not in the narrow area in which we are concerned with the relation between simple thoughts and complex thoughts. Okay, thank you. Michael Schmidt. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Francois. Uh, it was a great talk. I have the feeling we're making progress and I especially like this judgment first label and uh, how you framed the whole uh, issue and the genealogy as it were of the cancellation uh, account. Uh, I, I didn't know it uh, reaches back so far but uh, that's really fascinating and you know that as you noted our views are, uh, are very close but I also have a concern which I think is a bit similar than the one uh, that was raised earlier and I think I think one might try to focus it in the following way. So 
if you think about the force indicator as it's contained, say, in the conditional and the antecedent or consequent, and I think in one sense you will accept that there's a force indicator, at least in the, in the Herian sense of the tropic um, uh, or something like that, and then we might ask the question, what is the act that we perform in using this force indicator? Or do we use it? Or do we not use it? If we do not use it, then it seems to me that your view might collapse into the Bronx, into Bronzo's view that you say the act isn't really performed, but in any sense, but it's just it's just a simulation, and you don't want to say that it's a simulation in his sense, right? But on the other side, then you might lose the simulation element if you just say it's used just in the straightforward uh, forward sense. That, that, that seems to me is a difficulty for your view. Uh, actually, I wasn't thinking of, so you're thinking of sentences basically. You have sentences and you have a sentence that's embedded. The sentence embedded as a force indicator, let's assume say that for many people, declarative sentences are convey a force indicator for assertion, something like that, and you're asking, is it used or not? I wasn't particularly thinking of the case in which you use language. The, the same thing might apply in thought, uh, in which case I wouldn't talk of using a force indicator if you're simply thinking, a, say, a conditional, making a conditional judgment without using a sentence. So I'm, I'm not, I'm uneasy with this notion of using, but I want to say, and it's something that you don't seem to like, I want to say that actually there is this judgment that seems to correspond to the embedded sentence, but we don't make that judgment, we merely simulate it. So you're saying this is Bronzo's view. Actually, I agree with him that this is a simulation, so it's not really a judgment, this is a simulated judgment. The difference between us is that I think that this simulated judgment has a content, a genuine propositional content, which is just the content of the assertion that is simulated. Uh, so okay, that's so the difference so between us, but I agree with him that it's a simulation. Now you want to say, thinking of the case of language, that there is this sentence with a force indicator. You want to say the force indicator is actually used. Well, again, there is this notion of use. It's a sort of tricky notion. There is this use mention distinction, but that's very tricky because there are all sorts of uses. And even in cases in which you mention a word, you use it, so cases in which there is this autonomous use of words, you actually use the word to talk about itself, so this notion of use is not that clear. So I, I would agree that yes, of course you use it, perhaps as Bronzo would say, you use it to indicate which act it is that you're simulating. So, you, you, so thinking in terms of use of a, of a force marker as you do, uh, Bronzo would say something like this, you use the force marker to indicate which act it is that you're simulating, namely an act of assertion rather than an act of request, for example. That might be, yeah, that's a possible position. Uh, so could one but you're not performing the act of assertion. You're, that's the difference okay. with A1, with option A1. So could one describe your view by saying you say the act is simulated, but the content is, is real, as it yeah. were? Yeah. Of course, there might be cases in which the content also is, sim is not real. Uh, like in the case of fiction, you have something similar when you're reading fiction. There are cases in which there is some kind of simulation because the content, the content is genuine, but it's the assertion of the content that's simulated. But there are also cases in which there is simulation in the sense that there is no content there, but you're pretending that there is. For example, if someone tells you about Sherlock Holmes or you read about Sherlock Holmes, then the, the sentence about Sherlock Holmes doesn't really have a professional content or truth conditions because Sherlock Holmes doesn't exist. So in this case, the simulation would also affect professional content, not just the act of assertion. But I was talking about simple cases in which the content is there. So th th those are more complex cases, cases in which the simulation also affects the content. Um, Peter? I'm going to actually stop the... The sharing because I feel that it's not really necessary, and then the people on Zoom will appear normally, yes, which is good because then we can see if there are questions there. Everybody can see. There are yes, two there questions. Is at, le at least there. one, yeah. There are two questions on Zoom. Okay. Ready? One more. Uh, thanks. Um, so I hope this is a simple, quick, clarificatory question. Um, Trying to fit 
what you're saying today with your 2019 paper, the force cancellation paper, where in, in that paper you, you characterize the simulated assertion as a locutionary act, and then full-fledged assertion is the illocutionary act. And the way I understood that was that you do both when you just assert. So if I just assert something, I'm doing both the locutionary act and the illocutionary act. So the simulated assertion is there in the case when I just simply assert something. I agree. So, you, so today it sounded like your today it sounded like the view was when I just assert something, the simulation part does not. I don't simulate anything. I just assert. Okay. So here's a way of putting the question. No, no, right. On your on your on the view you have right now, when I just assert something, am I simulating an assertion? Answer no. <laughs> uh, no. So what I want to say, I don't know. I don't want to take a stance as to what I said in the paper, so there is, <laughs> but I'm going to, I mean, uh, what I want to say, and I thought I wanted to say then as well, is that the locutionary act is the thing you do in order to perform the illocutionary act. So if you want to assert that P, you say that P. Uh, you say that P, and by saying that P in the right context, you actually assert that P. When you simulate assertion that P, you don't uh, assert that P because you merely simulate the assertion, but you do the same sort of thing. You go through the motions because that's how you simulate anything. You always go through the motion. So you go through the motion, you do perform the locution act of saying that P, but you don't assert that P in those contexts. You merely go through the motion, and that doesn't yield full-fledged assertion. Now, of course, when you assert, I don't want to say that when you assert, you simulate. Either you assert or you simulate assertion. Even though John Austin once said that uh, in the case of pretense, it's possible to pretend to do something by actually doing the thing. He had this you know, idea of burglars pretending to be window cleaners. And uh, they pretend to be window cleaners by actually cleaning the windows, he said. So it's not clear that you have to choose either one or the other. And I'm not sure he was right in this, but let's forget that. So I want to say when you assert, you don't simulate, you actually assert. So the locutionary act, I wouldn't describe as the simulation of assertion. I would say rather performing the locutionary act is going through the motions of assertion that yields real assertion in a normal context. In certain contexts, when there is this canceling context, then the locutionary act of saying that P is not an act of asserting that P. It's merely going through the motion. And that's simulation. But that's not simulation when there is a true assertion. That's what I would okay. say. Okay, that's helpful. I think what's going on is Either you changed your view about locutionary hacks, or I misunderstood your view about, mis uh, about locutionary hacks from that earlier paper. Because I thought your view was the locutionary act is an act of making as if to assert that P. Uh, I think maybe in my very, very old book that was actually uh, basically my dissertation, Meaning on Force, uh, it may be then that I said something like that, that I described the locutionary act in those terms, but I don't think I did in that recent paper. Okay. Yeah, but I've got to check. Great. So we can take a question from yeah. Zoom, right? So uh, Max Kobel, I can read his question. Yeah, please, please read the question. OK, so Max had two questions. So the first one is this. Your main thesis is a priority thesis, judgment slash assertion first. Could you clarify the type of priority that you have in mind? I suspect it's not temporal, perhaps explanatory priority. If so, in which explanatory project? One concerning language or thought? So my answer is yes, it's a matter of explanation. It's conceptual priority. And the project is, uh, uh, is about thought. But uh, again, that's very controversial uh, because the relation, some people might say that the, the possibility of complex thought, like say conditional thoughts or disjunctive thoughts, depends on our having language. So many people believe that. And, 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 but actually, I want to provide a, a, another sort of foundation for understanding those complex thoughts, uh, not using language, which is the reason why I, my position I presented in that 2019 paper, which was really based upon language, I want to offer something broader than that. So it's really about thought, and, uh, and the, the priority I was talking about is uh, at the level of thought. The second part of his question was, um, 
as far as I can tell, Brentano's theory of representation is objectual, not propositional. So it's difficult to recruit him to your cause. Uh, however, Brentano does complete pure representations, or Stellungen, and he thinks of the desire for wine and in judgment that there is wine as involving the same pure representation. So it seems strange to attribute to him the view that pure representation already involves judgment. No, I mean, well, yes, actually there is a, so I didn't, when I talked about the position being Brentanian, or I talked about the B option, I only meant that it's a notion that uses the Brentanian idea of modification and that construes unasserted propositions as, as modified assertions. But, yes, but the, but of course, Brentano has his own theory of representation. He has this notion of judgment, the notion of simple representation. And I didn't mention him when I talked about the history of the topic, but would have been interested to add this Brentanian tradition to the, and to say how it relates to the different views I mentioned. But I didn't want to do that, and there is no commitment on my part when I said it's Brentanian. I don't mean that the, the view itself is Brentanian, only that it uses this Brentanian notion of modification. Uh, uh, Thanks for the talk, Francois. So, um, so I kind of like the simple Aristotelian view. Um, you, you like it, you say? Yeah, yeah, I okay. like it, yeah. It's nice and simple, it works. Um, and it seems like what you pointed out, which is very interesting, is that when you want to combine the judgment first view with the uh, sort of identification of uh, propositions with the archetypes of judgment, sort of can't do that, right? Because the A1 option collapses into the B option, and on the B option, you have to give it up. And it seems to me like you know, it would be nice to hold on to both of those views. And uh, so I'm sort of wondering whether there isn't a third option which you haven't considered, which sort of sticks to the A view, but then switches, switches from the idea that the in the context of embedding, the act is performed at all, right? Because you're not, you're like targeting the type instead, right? So you're, so you're, so you're shifting to the type. So you're not instantiating the type, you're targeting yes. the type, so the yes. relation is the... Yes, so and I think sort of that this, this is the sort of view that I think is already inherent in both Peter's and Scott Soames's own views. And so once you sort of push it to a logical conclusion, if you, go, if you go for that view, then in any case of embedding, you just target the type in an objectual act, you can hold on to everything, right? And that's your view, that's your view, which yes. I didn't talk about. Yes. Uh, it's, simi it's similar to Bronzo's view in that sense that the relation to the, the thing is different. For him, it's the simulation relation, we're simulating yes. the thing, we're not instantiating it, you said the same, we're not instantiating, we're targeting it. Uh, Okay, so that would be the possibility for okay. Silver to try to speak, and okay. we'll see whether that works. Uh, so yes, yeah, so it's interesting to try to fit that view into the general landscape. I think that there is a, it's one broad option of sort of changing the relation, uh, yes. and that's certainly. So the problem I have with this view is that I don't, we don't want to reify the. So there is this objectual thing, but that's not reference, and the, the difficulty. So I like the idea, but I'm, I, I don't see exactly how we can make it work. But it's sort of in the ballpark. And it's, there's that relation between that view and the others I haven't tried to map out, right, actually. yeah. So because the, the A1 view and the A2 view, you, you gave this sort of option. Like, it's either it's unasserted or it's not a proposition. Yeah. Whereas on that view, it does say it's unasserted. There's like assertion within it, but it is a proposition. It's not, so it's it's like not a really a proposition. Your view is in that sense similar to Bronzo. Bronzo says that the proposition doesn't occur as a part in the complex sentence. What occurs as a part is a simulation. And you want to say what occurs as a part is something that targets, I wouldn't say refers to because it's not reference for you, but something that targets a proposition is not the proposition itself. Well, That's a constituent. So it's. I would say actually that is the proposition because even on Peter's and Scott's views, the proposition is not supposed to be the token act but the type. So if the proposition is the type and the objectual act targets the type, actually that is the only way you get the proposition as a target rather than just the mere token act. 
Okay, anyway, yeah, interesting. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, so we can uh, try silver to yeah, see silver, whether that works. Try? Yeah, can you hear me now? Yeah, right. Ah, yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> Thank you so much, Francois, for the talk. And I'm afraid I do not have a reply now to your objection of um, um, you know, equivocation in my argument. But perhaps uh, I, I can respond with another object, uh, with a you know counter objection of equivocation, hoping that this would make some progress. So, um, if I understand your view, you want a notion of predication and proposition conceived as something truth viable that is at the same time a common factor between the forceful and the forceless case, while also maintaining the judgment first view that the forceful case is conceptually prior to the forceless one. Yes. And at some point in your talk, you mentioned briefly the, um, um, the, 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 the a, a disjunctive definition of uh, predication. Yes. And that gave me a sense, perhaps, uh, of what is your view. This is a possible interpretation. So if we go back to the example of uh, lemons and uh, plastic lemons, right? So we can define a kind of a weird notion of lemon, call it lemon star, such that a lemon star is either a real lemon or a plastic lemon. Yeah, good. Okay, so in this sense, you know, lemon star is a common factor between uh, real lemons and plastic lemons. Yeah, it's but at the same time, but at the same time, you know, the real lemon is the conceptually prior notion yeah, because absolutely. that's what you use to define the disjunctive genus, you know, that so yes. one member of the, you know, one species of the genus, the lemon star, is conceptually prior to the other um, plastic lemon, but at the same time, lemon star is a common factor between these two species. And uh, so perhaps uh, that's a, a way to, I mean, to define this, this disjunctive notion of a proposition and of something truth valuable, uh, valuable. But then it seems to me that as in the lemon case, we really have two different notions of lemon. You know, the real lemon, which is conceptually prior to the plastic lemon, and then the disjunctive notion lemon star. So, so it seems to me that in your view too, there are two notions of uh, propositions as something true, and true, true, two notions of being truth valuable, two notions of propositions, two notions of predication, one which carries the conceptual priority over the other one, and the other one which is defined um, yeah, disjunctively and so gives the common factor. So that would be my, my thought. I, I, I like the analogy very much. I don't see the objection really because I think it's a nice rendering of the view as applied to the case of lemon. I think that's exactly that. Uh, so indeed, conceptual priority to the real lemons because the other, the fake lemons, they are just copies. They copy certain aspects of the real lemons. Uh, so there is this dependence and this priority of the real lemons. At the same time, there is something that is shared by real lemons and, and copies of lemons. That's the reason why the copies of lemons are copies of lemons, because they share properties. Uh, they are th and, and the same is true. Assertion is the basic thing, but simulated assertions, because you go through the motion, they share a lot. And because there is the sharing, which is built into this very notion of dependence on priority, this sharing means that there is a super type uh, that is instantiated by both the real thing and the dependent thing. So there is this supertype, indeed, lemon star, that is instantiated both by real lemons and by copies of uh, uh, fake lemons. Uh, so I think it's exactly, yeah, it sort of works. Uh, and I don't, see, I don't see what the problem is. It's, this notion of predication is supposed to be common to the case in which we are certain, to the case in which we don't. That is, to the basic case and to the derived case. And I say yes, because whenever there is this relation of dependence, of something on something conceptually prior, uh, along the lines of simulation or that sort of thing, copying and so on, whenever that's the case, there is a supertype that is indeed shared. And therefore, we can certainly say that what we call propositions, the thing that's common to the two cases, is to be found at the level of this supertype. Uh, 
that's the view I'm putting forward, and, and again, you haven't really objected to it, rather clarified it by your analogy. Thank you. Okay, so we should stop there. Um, oh, yeah, but we're a little, we're running yeah, a little there is late a, already. Should we? I think we should stop. Yes, well, yeah, you, yeah. You, you're the okay, master so of time. <laughs> let, let's, uh, we'll reconvene with apologies to the questions we didn't get to. Um, we'll reconvene at 3.30, so in 10 minutes. Yep. For Silver's talk.